So over the past couple of days, there have been a few inquiries that have taken place. And um, I, I would guess that the, the majority, if not all of us, are aware of the hurricane that struck the East Coast um, recently. And uh, when moments like that happen and you see the, the videos and you see the news on everything and you see the devastation, uh, at least for me and probably for you as well, you, you know, you ask, what can we do to be a part of what's happening there? And so some people were asking, you know, what is our church doing for that? And so um, I, I wanted to just take a moment before the message and kind of explain um, one of the ways that we reach out here at the church. So we have um, something called Kingdom Builders. We talked about it a little bit earlier in the year. And what it is is, is a, a portion of our general budget that we use to um, fund different things. It funds foreign missionaries. We have missionaries uh, across the globe that we have the chance to be able to support. Um, it helps fund uh, people locally that need resourcing. It helps helps um, fund different pregnancy resource centers, all sorts of stuff. And, and one of the things that it also allows us to do is to support an organization called Convoy of Hope. And if you're unfamiliar with them, uh, Convoy of Hope is one of the, if not the, leading humanitarian aid um, efforts uh, really across the globe. Um, it's pretty significant what they do. And so uh, I just want to let you kind of see an update on one of the ways that one of our missionary partners has been helping those out. And so uh, know that if um, you give to the rise, a part of what you have already given has gone towards this effort. Um, and maybe the Lord would strike you this morning saying, I'd like to maybe um, uh, invest a little bit more in, into Kingdom Builders to watch the gospel go forth. So um, you're going to see a snapshot of it, and then I'll give you the back end on it. So uh, go ahead and turn your eyes to the screen as we get an update from Convoy of Hope. Hello, this, Hello, this is Hal Donaldson of Convoy of Hope, and today I'm standing in Swannanoa, North Carolina, which was devastated by Hurricane Helene. This is already considered one of the worst natural disasters in American history. I've traveled to hundreds of disaster zones, including Katrina, the earthquake in Haiti, and the tsunami in Indonesia. And this is one of the worst I've ever seen. This will be a long-term response for Convoy of Hope. We plan to be here for many months, helping survivors put their lives back together. And as the country mourns the lives that have been lost and as families search for those who are still missing, Convoy of Hope response teams and volunteers from churches and businesses are on the ground in places like this, hard hit areas. We're distributing food and water and emergency supplies in six states, North and South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, Virginia, and Tennessee. Now to date, more than 100 semi-truck loads of supplies have been distributed and many more truckloads are on the way. I just wanna say on behalf of the families and children ravaged by this hurricane. Thank you. Thank you for partnering with us to bring them help and hope during these uncertain times. In the coming weeks, undoubtedly, news coverage of this tragedy will wane, but the needs of those affected will be ongoing. With your help, we pledge to be here for the long haul. But God bless you and thank you again for caring and giving. Um, while God is not the author of destruction like that, uh, my Bible says he works all things together for the good of those who love him. So even in disaster, God can bring something beautiful out of it. So that's a, that's a freebie right there. That's not the sermon. Uh, if you got your Bibles with you, open up to the book of Romans chapter 13. Uh, if you're new with us, we've been going verse by verse through the book of Romans for Gosh, I feel like ever. It's just been going on. And it's been really, really good, us diving into it. And if you were with us last week, you know we ruffled some feathers. So uh, actually in the middle of the message um, last week, we had people walk out. Um, yeah, I'm like, I'm like, yes, that's a win right there. Not that I want people leaving. Please stay. We love you. Um, but when you preach the word of God, sometimes it can be a little bit offensive. And the goal is not to please people, but please the Lord. Amen. So let's look at what the Bible has to say in the book of Romans chapter 13, uh, in verse one, we taught on this last week. It says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there's no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. And that verse right there, um, people got mad at me. I'm like, I didn't write the book of Romans. Like that's Paul, take it up with him. Um, but in reading that verse, going through the book of Romans, we know that we are in the middle of what? We're in the middle of election season. 
and polity. Yeah, woohoo, everybody loves that. Um, and the Bible speaks about different things within the political realm. And what's really important is for us to not only educate ourselves on what the Bible says, but also to make sure the next generation understands. Like I'm looking right here, we're now three rows deep in teenagers over here, which I think is pretty cool. Um, Rise Kids is packed out with, you guys get a round of applause. I don't get nothing. You guys get all the love over there. Uh, we got Rise Kids um, back there, just, um, you know, babies, toddlers, elementary schoolers doing church on the other side of the school. Uh, and we have this privilege of not only educating ourselves, but passing it on to the next generation because within the local education system and media, how many of you know they're not necessarily getting the full truth on things? So uh, what I wanna do is to go through not only this verse, but to answer a couple of questions that were submitted. So at the end of the message last week, where we talked about what it means to be citizens who are involved with uh, different issues going on, we opened it up. We said, if you have a question on politics, Send it in and we will do our best if there's a Bible verse that applies to it to share what the answer is on that. And so I, I promise you, today is not about Michael's opinions on things. Because uh, how many of you guys know Michael's been wrong before? All right, I got people raising their hand. I, I, that's, I don't know what that means. <laughs> but what I, what I do know is that it doesn't matter my opinion on it. It matters what God's opinion is on it. Because I want to submit everything in my life to the Lord and you should submit everything in your life to the Lord and we'll let the word of God speak to it because the word of God is the authority, not man. Amen? So when we read this passage right here, we read that every single one of us should subject ourselves or we could also use the word submit ourselves to governing authorities. And that was the one that some people got frustrated about. And so let me give a little bit of context to that. That doesn't mean lie down and let the government walk all over you. It does not mean that at all. Like, if you look at Jesus, Jesus was a wild dude. There was a moment in the church, or it was in the temple back then, where they were um, doing some money laundering and doing some different things that weren't right, and Jesus comes in and has a bull whip and starts whipping it around and literally flipping tables over. And I thought about, for a second, as an illustration, to flip this table over and for you guys to be like, whoa, this is crazy what's happening. But I figured I could just tell you, and that way we don't have to buy a new table. So imagine that I did this and you're all shocked because that's how Jesus was. Jesus called a spade a spade. There's even a moment where he's under trial and the guy who's um, doing the trial is like, you realize I can put you to death. And Jesus is like, you realize the only reason you can do that is because my father gave you the, the authority. And it's like, whoa, like he's dropping some, some, some nuggets right there that really, really put into perspective that he wouldn't just lie down with things. So what we have the chance to do as believers in 2024 is we know that we are to follow the rules of the land. If you go 95 miles an hour in a 60, like I was talking with somebody a little bit earlier today, you're going to find a Henrico officer that will pull you over. And if you say, I love Jesus, they'll say, great, here's your ticket. Because the rules apply. Now, there are times and there are moments in history where the rules of the government go against Scripture. And at that point, you say, God is my ultimate authority. I'm going to follow him before the local law. But outside of those extreme scenarios, we are to be people that function well within society. And if you were to look at the Roman church at this time, you think things are tough here in America right now? You need to get outside of America once. Because I'm telling you, we live in the greatest nation on earth, in my opinion. And our freedoms here are absolutely incredible. And I am so thankful for the men and women that have laid down their life so that we can have moments like this. So here is what I think the trap that the church falls into when it comes to politics. Because that was one of the questions that was asked. I'm going to paraphrase this one. Uh, another question I'll read word for word. But the, the, the paraphrasing of it was essentially like, how do you deal when it comes to your faith and to politics? Like, how should you behave in this? And so Jesus in John chapter 19, verse 11, what I just told you a moment ago, Jesus answered to him and said, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. 
So Jesus is going face to face with this. Jesus is really confronting what's going on. And Jesus is engaged in politics right here. There's political uproar going on. That statement is him literally speaking into a political situation. If you look at the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Romans, which we're going through right now, Paul is talking about that because there are political issues that are happening. And so, in my opinion, and I would say scripturally, I can back this up, the idea that we can just ignore what's happening in government is really a shallow way of exercising our faith. If the Bible speaks on it, we should engage in it. And the Bible speaks on a variety of subjects and we can't pick and choose which ones we want. And so we have the privilege to be able to utilize our rights to stand up for biblical values. But what Jesus knows and what Paul knows is that while they are involved in the political schemes, they have a greater calling. And the greater calling is the advancement of the gospel. So, If you could put, I don't know what your political passion is, but if you could put it at, let's say, a six or a seven, some of you guys, it's like a 14, you need to calm down, but we'll put it at like a seven for a second. Jesus and his agenda, which is the gospel and love, supersedes that. Even when he came in right before his death, they thought it was a political takeover, but Jesus was offering something greater than that. So I'm going to tell you that God loves people. And you should too. And when it comes to disagreements or different philosophical arguments, unfortunately, sometimes we ignore that. So a few weeks ago in Romans, we were in chapter 12, and it says this in the 18th verse. If possible, so as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Now, it does say, if possible. There are moments where it is not possible to live peaceably with people. If you come after my wife, Lord have mercy. If you come after one of my three girls, Lord have mercy. If you come after one of my two sons, we're all going to gang up and come after you, okay? I'm just saying... There's a responsibility for me as the the father in the house to protect my family. And I'm not ashamed to do that in any way. There are moments where offenses take place and lines are crossed where you go, is it possible? No. But there are a lot of times where is it possible as far as it depends on you to live peaceably with people? And the answer is absolutely yes. And for whatever reason, we get so tied up and we get so excited or we get so engaged in a particular issue that we lose the fact that we are called to live peaceably with others and to love people. The reality is that earlier in this series, when we were back in Romans chapter 3, we talked about the subject of total depravity. And if you remember that, it comes from Romans chapter 3, verse 23. It says, for all have sinned. How many is all? All means all, right? So that's all of us, all of humanity, every single person that's ever existed with the exception of Jesus has fallen short of the glory of God. So now we have this conundrum. We have us who are called to love, us who are called to live peaceably, yet in this world, there are all sorts of people that are a hot mess and making bad choices. And can I just add to the layer on this? In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, it says, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. The future of this planet is not good. It's, I, I love happy endings. They're so good. The worst is when you get a movie that ends bad. You ever seen one of those before where you're like, what were you thinking, writer? You could have turned this around and you just decided to be a jerk and ruin it for all of us. Like, I, I would love to throw the happy ending on earth, but the truth is, is that our world is continually spiraling downwards into more and more carnal nature. Now, in the end, we do know that Jesus comes back in victory, and he comes back and he literally eliminates the entire world and makes a new heaven and a new earth, and that's paradise. But until that day, things are going to get tough. And when things get tough, it's the chance for the church to be able to stand up and really put an exclamation point on what they believe. And unfortunately, 
as the world goes down, it sometimes takes believers with it. Where we're called to love, and the world is beginning to hate, and we begin to take on the identity of the world and hate people, rather than us encouraging the world to embrace the cloak of love. And so if you could take a look at what you're screaming for, are you screaming for love or are you screaming for hate? And political season will really ramp that up. In the book of John, chapter 15, verse 18 through 19, it says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, then the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And so as our world continues on, Christian values are going to line up with the world hating us more than embracing us. And that's just a reality that Jesus promises right here. And that can be very, very difficult, but we need to have the courage and I would say the, uh, the, almost the audacity to be able to speak up and say this is what Scripture says on particular issues. We should not conform ourselves to the world, but rather let the Word transform our minds and therefore conform to the ways of Christ. So the devil's trap is Ephesians six twelve. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. That's where the battle is. The battle, is it physical or spiritual? The battle is spiritual. Everything is rooted in the spirit. Spiritual wrestle is where the actual battle happens, yet we tend to take our battle and make it physical. The way that we're going to get out of this issue is we're going to fight for it physically. The way that we're going to do this is we're going to try to manipulate the story on something rather than actually taking time and fighting it in the spiritual way. Do you spend more time proclaiming your opinion or going to the Lord in prayer? Do you spend more time researching the political issues from a right side or a left side? Or do you spend more time seeing what God's word has to say about it? Because I want to find myself rooted in God's word, not on what the world says. Because I'm first and foremost a citizen of heaven and secondarily a resident here in the state of Virginia. Am I, am I speaking truth right now? Are you, are you guys all right with this? It's quiet. I'm, I'm trying to find out if uh, you guys are all going to leave or you're going to come back for more. In John 13... It says this, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have what for one another? If you have love. Love is the way that we do life. Love is the ultimate authority. In 1 John 4, 20, it says, if anyone says I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love him does not love his brother whom he is not, who he, whew, I'm gonna try that one again. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So if we can see other people, our job should be to love them first and foremost. And that shows that we actually love God. And then in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, And above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And so as we are going to talk about sensitive subjects, because the Bible hits on these, what's more important than the subject is love. How many of you know there's a loving way to communicate something and an unloving way to communicate something? But perhaps one of the most unloving things you can do is to remain silent and to not speak the truth into critical issues. And so I have seen something that probably you guys have seen throughout the past couple of weeks as well on my social feeds, which is how I personally consume the majority of news. I'm not saying it's the right way to do it. I'm not saying it's the wrong way to do it. I'm not saying it's unbiased or biased. There's a lot of wrong out there, but I'm just saying that's how I consume a lot of news. And I'll get on there and I'm looking at things and it knows who I am. And so I see stuff about deer hunting. I see stuff about pickup trucks and things about Jesus. Like, that's just what my news feed looks like, okay? So I'm going through it, and there's a pastor there, and he's, he's saying statements like this. If you're a Christian, you have to be Republican. And if you are a Democrat, you are a Satanist, and you are demon-possessed. I'm like, wow. I'm so glad nobody said amen right now. 
<laughs> because there's other ones where I see a different feed and it goes, how in the world could you ever support that guy? He is so far from Christian values. If you are a believer, you must be on the Democrat side of things and anybody who loves Jesus cannot side with the right. And so I have things on both sides. And I would say actually in this room right here, we have people that are on both sides of the political equation. And when you see people on the left and people on the right, what bridges the two is this thing called love that we just talked about. Do not be so narrow-minded that you miss the chance to minister and love other people around you. Our world has lost the ability to talk about things and to have disagreements where we still can agree on the main thing, which is Jesus. And so what I'm going to try to do um, somewhat today, um, gosh, I only have 10 minutes to go through all of the rest of the things. Um, we're going to go into this next week. Um, but I'll, I'll hit one issue today, and I'll hit a couple more next week. Um, but let me just go ahead and read a question. We're going to start off with a, with a doozy right now. You guys ready for this? These are not my words. Lord, help me. If God gave us free will and no sin is greater than another, and we have to answer to him in the end, why does an abortion law matter? It is not my personal choice to abort, but I do feel that women should have a choice over their body, and if they choose to do that, then they answer to God, just as we all will answer to God for what we do on earth. Whoo, y'all ready? <laughs> oh, we got one person that's ready, okay. So... In this question, um, let me hit on a question that wasn't asked that I think is incredibly important. When it comes to abortion, the grace of Jesus is greater. And I'm not going to assume that I know what's going on in everybody's life here. And I'm also going to assume that I am not the final judge on things. But what I do know is that regardless of what your past looks like, the grace of Jesus is present in your life if you ask for it. And so as I give a biblical answer to this, please know this is not a message of condemnation. In fact, I would say it's a message of love, that God loves his people. The word of God is, however, incredibly clear on this particular issue. And... The media has tried to silence the church on this. And so I can think, I mean, the seven years we've been here, I think I've only spoke out on this topic one time. And so let me give you some background on this. So the question is this, if God gave us free will and no sin is greater than another's, how this started off. And let me say, did God give us free will? 100%. He gave us free will. Does he have everything in his purview and he is the one who is fully in control of things? Absolutely, yes. Before the foundations of the earth, he laid this out. But we do have free will today. We can throw things if we want to. We can make bad decisions if we want to. We can go 96 miles an hour if we want to. We have free will. But the ideology that no sin is greater than another uh, is kind of not true. Because if you steal a candy bar... Any of y'all ever steal a candy bar? Nope, not one of them. We have the best youth ministry in the world. All right. If you steal a candy bar, that is sin, that is stealing. The wages of sin is death. So if you steal a candy bar, if you disobey your parents, if you do anything right there, white lie, all of that disqualifies you from everlasting life with God in heaven. But Jesus, right? We know that Jesus forgives sinners like me, forgives sinners like you, forgives sinners like all of us. That is the weight of stealing a candy bar. If you somehow are still alive and you are the original Adolf Hitler, the father of the Holocaust, horrendous things took place that should have never happened. And the wages for that is death and separation from Christ for all of eternity, if not for the blood of Christ. But if we were to use our common sense, we know there's a difference between the Holocaust and the candy bar, right? 
there's a difference in how that impacts our world. So we know that no matter what the sin is, the penalty is death, but there are some things that have different moral values to them. Some things that are a little bit weightier than others. And so the idea that if God gave us free will and no sin is greater than another, well, you know, there are some sins that have greater weight to them. The penalty is the same for all of them. But it even says that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the greatest one. So we know there's weighting of things here. So I'm going to say that not all sin is equal. All of it disqualifies you from heaven. But there are ones such as the Ten Commandments that give you an idea of certain things that have greater weight. So when it talks about the fact that you should not murder that is a big, big deal. In Luke chapter 1, in the 41st verse through verse 44, I believe you see the greatest argument for where life begins. We could take some Old Testament passages and we could argue on those, but this one right here is for me one of the things that's formed my particular view on this subject. It says this in the 41st verse. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary... The baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. She exclaimed with a loud cry, blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy." So if you don't know the background of this, let me give you the background of this. There is a person named Elizabeth. She is pregnant with a son who is going to be named John. Specifically, John the Baptist is who this is. He is going to be the one who baptizes Jesus. And so John has been prophesied. There was a moment with, with John's dad where it was a, your wife is going to have a son and you're going to name him John. You can't speak until all this takes place. And so this is in motion. There is a baby in the womb who's named and has a destiny. Not only is this baby named and has a destiny, but we know that while this baby is still in the womb, when a physical and spiritual presence shows up, there is a fear, uh, physical and spiritual manifestation that takes place. So there's a baby in the womb, it hears the voice of Mary, and it leaps. There is a baby in the womb, and the Holy Spirit comes and falls in that moment. And if you look at this right here, you have to go... There is human spirit-filled value in this baby that is in the womb. And if you take that and you combine it with other passages such as being fearfully and wonderfully made, being known in your mother's womb, I do not see scripturally how you can separate the idea of a baby in the womb and life. And if you say that in the wrong group, you will be shamed because of it. If I say that as a male my voice can sometimes be discounted because of my gender and my chromosomes. But what I know is this opinion is not so much Michael's opinion, but I would say this is what the Lord has to say about it. This is simply extracting text and saying what the text says. So going back to this question right here. It says, it's not my personal choice to abort, but I do feel that women should have choices over their body. And to that I would say amen. If there's any lady out there who is getting unwelcome advances from a man, I hope you kick them as hard as you can. In the name of Jesus, share the gospel as you're giving them a big old, because it's your body, it's your choice. You should be able to have decision-making capability when it comes to your body. But what I know is that my wife doesn't actually have full authority over her body. I do. And I actually don't have full authority over my body. She does. So we know there's this idea of while we have authority over things, there's also submission that takes place. And I would submit to you that part of carrying a child is submitting to the fact that that life has value and that removing that life is, in fact, murder. And that is a big statement to make. So in this, I feel that women should have a choice over their bodies. And if they choose to do that, they answer to God. And I would say absolutely they answer to God. And I hope and I pray 
They not only know who Jesus is, but that the Holy Spirit comes and rests on them and they sense forgiveness and peace like no other person would ever experience except for the fact that God is moving in their life. This is not a message of condemnation. This is laying out what the truth is and saying, Holy Spirit, come and do a healing work. Because I know there's mistakes that I've made that I go, ah, the consequences for this are so bad and there's a chain reaction. I say, Lord, heal me from the decisions I've made. And I pray the same thing takes place for this. So if they have choice over their body and if they choose to do that, they answer to God just as we all answer for what we do on earth. And I would say that looking at this question right here, one, I'm glad that this person would not choose to abort. But number two, I would say that as far as morality comes, the Bible is clear on this that if we have the ability to preserve human life, we're going to preserve human life. If we have the ability to see kids back there and rise kids, come and grow up and know the ways of Jesus, we will do everything we can to make sure that takes place. If we have the ability to watch them go from babies to elementary schoolers to middle schoolers, we're gonna make sure we can do everything we can to instill the values of Christ in the next generation. Because where the church unfortunately has become guilty of is being so rigid on that viewpoint, which I would say great, but then neglecting to care for the child afterwards. And saying, you made this choice, good luck. So one of the things I love, and I'm not saying we're the best church in the world. I think we're the best church in the world, but I'm not saying we absolutely are. But what I'm saying is I love when a single mom shows up at one of the women's groups. And is going, I don't know how to manage all this. And we go, don't worry, there's a safe environment for your kids with child care workers that are already paid for. So you can have a moment and build relationships with other women while your kids are watched in a safe place because we love them and we love you. And that's what the church should do. When there's a single mom who's struggling to make bills, we go, you know what? We've been able to collect some resources. Let's help you out with this and help you stand taller and not just throw shame on you. The church, if we're going to love people, we need to love them from the womb all the way to the tomb and everywhere in between. That's what we are called to do. And with that, I've gone two minutes over. I only got through one question. The more you go through some of the ones that are out there, um, you're going to see that there's a kind of a split on this. And so I'm not going to just pick right issues. I'm not going to pick, just pick left issues. I want to try to give a balanced viewpoint on this. And then when you get the tools, you can say, where do I see the most importance with these things? There's a reason why if you go on most political websites, you will see the sanctity of life as the number one at the top. And that is because Jesus did what? Jesus came and died so that you may have life and have life abundantly. And so my bigger question then what your view is on abortion or what your view is on loving people or what your view is on politics or what your view is on Romans is where do you stand with this knowledge of Jesus Christ? Because that, that's the big picture right there. People have been debating about this subject for years and they're going to keep on debating about it for years. Solomon, the wisest man who ever walked this earth, said nothing is new under the sun. These issues are going to keep coming up, but the one thing that we really need to evaluate is where do you stand when it comes to your relationship with Jesus? We know from Romans chapter 3 that every single one of us have sinned and every single one of us have fallen short of the glory of God, thus creating a separation between us and Jesus. The good news is, is that Jesus came, lived, and died, that if you would trust in him, your sins would be forgiven and you would have the promise of everlasting life. Have you trusted in Jesus? Have you trusted in Jesus? I uh, look at my kids. Some of them have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Some of them are still toddlers and they need Jesus in their life. <laughs> but what I know is that my faith is not going to save my 11-year-old. My faith is not going to save my 8-year-old or 9 or however old she is or the other rest of them. If you don't know, I have five kids and I can't count well. So my faith won't save them. Just like my faith won't save you or your parents' faith won't save you. It's a personal decision. God wants to be your Lord and your Savior. 
The book of Romans said that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from that separation because of the depravity of man. And so as the worship team's coming back up, I want to ask if you'd bow your heads for a moment. We hit a heavy, heavy subject this morning. What we can agree on is that God loves you so much that he hung on a cross to forgive your sins. The question is, have you responded to that? And so everybody's head is bowed right now. Eyes are closed. You're having a private moment of personal reflection. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, may today be the day that you begin that relationship. You don't have to have it all figured out. You just got to know that he's the king and that he loves you. If you want to begin that relationship with Jesus today or rededicate your life, would you slip your hand up right now so I know who I'm going to pray for? Thank you. Put your hand down. Anybody else? If you want to rededicate your life to Jesus or begin a relationship with him. All right, church, I want to ask if you'd stand to your feet. Can I tell you what is not a fun thing to do? Preach on politics. Can I tell you what's a really fun thing? When you preach on politics and somebody gets saved. There were hands that went up in this room, people who are not sure where they stand with their relationship with Jesus. And we're gonna pray in a moment. And if you believe in your heart that Jesus not only came, but he died and he rose again for your sins, you will be saved. You will cross over from death to life. You are what the Bible says, a new creation in him, a born again believer. And when that happens here in this church, we celebrate it because the Bible says that in heaven, there's a celebration going on. So we're going to celebrate down here. Amen. And we don't want anybody to pray alone because this thing is church family. And so I'm going to lead us in prayer right now. And if you're praying this for the first time, this is a big day for you. Church, would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his life. I thank you for his life. His death. His death. And his resurrection. His resurrection. Jesus, I know I've made mistakes. Jesus, I know I've made mistakes. I know I have sin in my life. I know I have sin in my life. I turn away from my sin. I turn away from my sin. And I turn toward you. And I turn toward you. Jesus be my Lord. Jesus be my Lord. And Jesus be my Savior. Jesus be my Savior. I promise today, I promise today. to follow you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Somebody just crossed over from death to life. Can we give God some praise in this place? So what I love, and I don't know who it was in here. I can't see that far in. It's dark. Um, we sang this song about our affection, our devotion poured out to Jesus. You may have sung that song one way at the beginning of service, but you're going to sing it through a different lens right now. The lens of you are my Lord and you are my Savior. And so church, together, can we pour out our love to Jesus this morning?